Hi, I'm Steve Clemens. I direct the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation and write the blog, The Washington Note. And I'm here with my friend J.P. Singh, who is an associate professor uh, at Georgetown University, a uh, consultant to the WTO. He's been a consultant to, to, to uh, uh, groups working on the uh, uh, property rights and, and information technology sectors uh, for many years. And he has written uh, a new book, Negotiation and the Global Information Economy, where he goes through um, a set of templates of thinking about the actors in negotiations, the environment of negotiations, the process of them, you know, and the difference between sort of a hierarchical ordered world and a flat world, you know, to use the Tom Friedman sense. JP, it's good to be with you today. Thank you, Steve. Uh, what do you think the relevant, I mean, this is an academic book. Uh, I found it fascinating in the longer presentation uh, that you did. But what do you think the relevance of, of your findings are for an Obama administration that's now coming out and beginning to deal with so many different tasks uh, uh, after the era that we've just come from. Well, thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me here. Um, I hope it resonates with the Obama administration. The first thing I did when the book came out was mail a copy to Ron Kirk, hoping that he would get <laughs> confirmed one and B, yeah. that he would read it. Yes. And so I don't know about the B, but the A uh, has happened. Um, the main lessons are this. One, that uh, it's not a flat world or a hierarchical world. It's both. And that if we're going to act as a great power like we did in the last eight years, we would want to make it into a hierarchical world over and over again. What we'll get from that are kind of strategic posturings that the Bush administration did. Right. And from the strategic posturings, what we would get are agreements which are not going to be seen as legitimate around the world. The opportunity now is to see the world as diffuse to lead, to persuade, through a lot of problem solving happening in the negotiations, and to get the world to go along with us. And in what I've done in this book is to so show... the diffusion mm -hmm. of power is an opportunity? Yes, it can be an opportunity uh, both ways. It can be an opportunity to recreate a hierarchical world, or it can be an opportunity to create a very legitimate world in which we have binding agreements and where other players buy into those agreements. So I think the kind of moves that Obama administration has made in the Czech Republic in terms of the major speech that he gave, the kind of moves he's made in Turkey, uh, trying to start talks with Iran, the six party talks in North Korea or in Iran, I think those are the kind of things that uh, would resonate with this book and where the book should resonate is what do you do inside which is about so, problem solving. So that's on the US side and so I sort of sense you know, not to make it too simple, it's sort of a stakeholder approach mm -hmm. to successful negotiations and legitimacy and to get something. Mm -hmm. How do you think Iran looks at this, North Korea, Cuba? How do you think outliers out there that aren't part of this look from their perspective at the question of the negotiations process? I think they looked at the same way that the U.S. did. U.S. is not the only one which has been socialized into an us versus them approach, except that when U.S. practiced the us versus them approach, the them ran with it mm. and then were able to throw bricks at the us. Uh, now, in a multilateral sort of a context, what the U.S. can do, in, in some ways that's where the power belongs to the weak, right? Uh, what the U.S. can do, and uh, the multilateral approach is not, as I said in there, a Disneyland type of approach where we all hold hands, is to worsen the alternatives of the other side by playing the cards much more carefully and by getting allies and non-allies to go along with that. And so if I were in Iran, uh, I would first of all say, what do I want of, out of this? Uh, can I get my food and other supplies and industrial supplies, et cetera, from Europe? And then if the U.S. is really working with the Europeans on that, that's kind of the value chain that matters to an Iran. And the U.S. can worsen or strengthen that kind of a value chain there. If then the U.S. gets Russia to go along, that's another card that Iran would then have to rethink. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you just one final question, a mm -hmm. theoretical question. Um, I don't know if you've read deeply the work of John Eikenberry, G. John Eikenberry mm -hmm. of Princeton. He has this notion uh, of the liberal Leviathan, that, that the United States still today is mm -hmm. so massively powerful compared to any other potential rivals. Um, and I disagree with him, by the way, but, but mm -hmm. he's got this view that, that the world organizes to essentially constrain that power. And the way you find a balance is that the Leviathan negotiates and help provide public goods internationally to others to sort of keep them at bay and kind mm -hmm. of keep the system. What do you say to John Eikenberry with regards to the question of negotiations? Are we so, in your view, are we that hyperpower that mm -hmm. has to sort of trade public goods provisions to maintain flexibility so that the rest of the world, which united, would be mm -hmm. disproportionately influential? I mean, how, mm -hmm. how would you see an yeah. Eikenberry thesis? 
Well, one, that the Eikenberry thesis actually is reflected in other IR theorists too. The bound to lead scenario mm. is that no matter what happens, U.S. is bound to lead. Uh, I would say that you're not going to have any public goods provision in the world unless the U.S. did go along with it. And that's mm. why we know that uh, the Kyoto Protocol, for however efficacious it might be, unless the U.S. finally comes around, that no, nothing's going to happen. Uh, similarly with other kinds of issues. Uh, however, here's the catch. U.S. doesn't have to provide the public good anymore. Mm. We need the U.S. to be on it for the good to get provided. Mm. Right? So and someone so, else provides the good yeah. if we give the stamp of approval. Right, exactly. And so it's one, it, it may be the primus inter pares, but it's not right at the top. So in other words, uh, there is all kinds of public goods provision which is happening at regional levels and other levels. But oftentimes at the global level, those public goods are are, are, uh, don't carry that legitimacy in terms of due obedience in the barbarian sense because the U.S. didn't sign on. Well, JP, I want to thank you. He gave, uh, for those watching this uh, clip, uh, the first uh, talk I've ever he he uh, heard him give without a hundred citations of the giants on whose shoulders he uh, stands, which is perfect for Washington policy community. So thank you so much, JP. Thank you, Thanks Steve. Thank you for being here. All right. Thank you. All right.